Today, as we continue our series, Reframing Jesus, I'm going to flip my clock over so it tells me what time I'm at so I don't go long. Uh, uh, I'd like to share with you a story I found some years ago uh, titled The Golden Telephone. This is what it says. A man in Topeka, Kansas, decided to write a book about churches around the country. He started by flying to San Francisco and started working east from there. Going to a very large church, he began taking photographs and making notes. He spotted a golden telephone on the vestibule wall and was intrigued with a sign which read $10,000 a minute. Seeking out the pastor, he asked about the phone and the sign. The pastor answered that this golden phone is in fact a direct line to heaven and if he pays the price, he can talk directly to God. The man thanked the pastor and continued on his way. As he continued to visit churches in Austin, New York, Michigan, Chicago, Milwaukee, and all around the U.S., he found more phones with the same sign and the same answer from each pastor. Finally, he arrived back on the West Coast in Seattle in the middle of the summer. Upon entering a church in the Seattle area, behold, he saw the usual golden telephone, but this time the sign read, calls 35 cents. Fascinated, he asked to talk to the pastor, Reverend, I've been in cities all across the country and in each church I've found this golden telephone and have been told it is a direct line to heaven and I could talk to God, but in the other churches the cost was $10,000 a minute. Your sign reads 35 cents a call. Why? The pastor, smiling benignly, replied, Son, you're in the Pacific Northwest now. It's a local call. <laughs> I must confess, I'm a big fan of the Pacific Northwest. When we lived in Minnesota, one of the men in our church liked to refer to it as God's country, I remember thinking, this guy hasn't traveled very far, and he's certainly never been to the Pacific Northwest. When we got to come back to the Pacific Northwest after three and a half years in Minnesota, we were ecstatic. Having said this, I also know that there really is no place that is more inherently God-blessed than any other. I can find God in Minnesota just as surely as I can find God in Renton. And honestly, the idea that any man-made gadget or religious system or religious guru can get me closer to God is simply ludicrous. But think of how many people have been fooled by some spiritual-sounding self-help book, some slick-talking spiritual leader, some new and improved gospel. We're always trading God for gimmicks. It's true today. And it was certainly true in Jesus' day. The religious leaders in the first century had man-made religion down to a science. Oh, it had all the trappings of truth. It was clothed in the language of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. But they had traded in God for gimmicks. Divine law for man-made rules and divine mercy for a spiritual bartering system. The Jewish religious leaders like to think that they had a direct line to God, a golden telephone. Pay the price of admission and they will hook you up. It was a pay-to-play arrangement, and they were enriching themselves off of it both in money and power. Then came Jesus, challenging the status quo, calling these religious leaders what they were, hypocrites, self-serving frauds. It didn't take them too long <laughs> to see that Jesus was threatening their way of life, and it also didn't take them very long to see what had to be done. Jesus had to go. And so John 18 finds us in the greatest court case ever, the religious establishment versus Jesus. And although this case was rigged from the start, a guilty verdict predetermined, it does exactly what any good course case should do. It exposes the truth. What we find is that Jesus was not just another competing gimmick, a competing pay-to-play arrangement. He was the real deal. Even though the verdict of the case is guilty, I suggest that the verdict John is pointing to is something altogether different, as we shall see in a sermon titled, Reframing the Verdict. I invite you to take your sermon outline by this name from your bulletin. If you didn't receive one, just raise your hand and Klaus 
we'll make sure to get it to you. I also invite you to turn in your Bible to John chapter 18. We'll begin this morning in verse 28. What is it that makes this verdict so unique? Well, the answer is found in a statement famed defense attorney Johnny Cochran once made. You remember Johnny Cochran of O.J. Simpson fame? In Time Magazine, Johnny was asked, which historical figure would you wish to have had for a client? Johnny's response, Jesus is the person I would have liked to have defended. I would have relished the opportunity to defend someone who is completely innocent of all charges. However, because of his mission here, he would have undoubtedly declined. Johnny's right. And this is exactly what we find starting in John 18, verse 28. This is what we read. Then the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, the Jews did not enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover. Now there's a handful of scenes that make up John's retelling of this court case. What we find in each of these scenes, beginning with scene number one, is that each one includes Pilate's argument and the irony that we find in each of these scenes. Deborah, would you be so gracious to get me a bottle of water? Thank you. A large bottle of water. The funny thing about this court case is that in a real sense, Pilate is playing both the judge and Jesus' defense attorney. Jesus doesn't actually have an attorney, but Pilate is bright enough to see that the Jewish leaders have a weak case. And so whether it's to puff up his own ego or just because he enjoys running these religious leaders over the coals, Pilate decides to play devil's advocate on behalf of Jesus. And each of his arguments on Christ's behalf served to highlight the irony resident in this case. The irony begins before Pilate even says a word. We see it in John's introduction there in verse 28. Why is it that the Jews won't enter his palace? Do you see it there? It's because if they enter the palace of a Gentile, they'll become unclean and won't be able to celebrate the Sabbath. Now think about this for a moment. Jesus, who is the Sabbath, who is the key to their rest, they're willing to crucify him, but in doing so, they don't want to enter a Gentile's home for fear that they will become unclean. When you think about it, the irony is thick. It's almost hard to even contemplate. Listen to one commentator's commentary on this passage. He says, they were scrupulous about contracting a defilement that would prevent them from keeping the feast on the due date, but they were not at all concerned about taking part in an act of judicial murder. Murder's no big deal, but don't let us be unclean because then we couldn't enjoy the feast. <laughs> and we really like the feasting part of this holy day. Another commentator writes, the Jews take elaborate precautions to avoid ritual contamination in order to eat the Passover at the very time they are busy manipulating the judicial system to secure the death of him who alone is the true Passover. How is Jesus the true Passover? Quite simply, the first Passover temporarily restrained God's wrath, protecting God's people. Jesus' sin-conquering death is going to remove God's wrath completely, providing for the salvation of all who would trust in Him, including the very people who are about to kill Him. He's dying for them too. These people are concerned about ritual cleanness, but show no concern about taking innocent life, let alone the life of their own Messiah. 
talk about can't see the forest for the trees or cutting off your nose to spite your face. And I'm sure there are a hundred other different sayings you could apply to this to demonstrate how absolutely ludicrous it is, this portrait that John is trying to play, paint. Sadly, this ludicrous kind of religiosity is all too common in our age as well. How many profess Jesus yet disavow the authority of his word? I love Jesus. I just don't like to do what he says. How many proclaim to be his disciples while living in contradiction to his teaching and harming other people along the way? How many who call themselves by the name of Christ use differences on secondary matters to sow division? Or on the other extreme, embrace a tolerance that makes Scripture a slave to man's whims? There is no greater irony than when we do things in God's name that actually militate against God's will and His kingdom. And that's what we see here in verse 28. However, though the Jewish leaders can't see it, the irony is not lost on Pilate. Pilate gets it. <laughs> says, this doesn't make any sense. This guy hasn't done anything. Verse 29 and following. So Pilate came out to them and asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, the Jews objected. This happened so that the words Jesus had spoken indicating the kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. So Pilate starts off saying, if this man has transgressed your laws, you deal with him. Now, at first blush, we might want to make Pilate the hero of this story. After all, he is the one who so aptly points out the ludicrous nature of this case. But as great New Testament theologian D.A. Carson points out, Pilate is no saint. The pilot disclosed in the historical documents almost certainly acted like this, not so much out of any passion for justice as out of the ego-building satisfaction he gained from making the Jewish authorities jump through legal hoops and recognize his authority. This is really a game to pilot, a bit of a one-upsmanship. However, he really does make some powerful points, beginning with this first one that you see on your outline. Jesus is your king. Look at verses 33 through 37. It says, Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied? It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it that you've done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What an intriguing dialogue takes place here between a Roman governor and the governor of the world. Yet it really brings out the irony of what is taking place. Here is Jesus, king of the Jews, being persecuted and prosecuted by his own people. When you boil it down, the irony is that for the religious leaders, religiosity trumps Messiah. People in authority are not fond of disruptors of the status quo. Think about that. People in authority are not fond of disruptors of the status quo. Why? Because it threatens their authority. We've seen it in the latest news cycles, even this week. The USA Today headline on Tuesday read, the once untouchable Puerto Rico Governor Ricardo Roseo, can he survive? Well, the answer, by the way, a few days later came out, right? No, he can't. He tried, though. He tried as hard as he could to hold on to power, even though people were rioting in the streets. He tried to hold on to power. Why? Because people in authority are not fond of disruptors of the status quo. 
Is this not also the core issue that we see, or I should say we saw in the Mueller hearings this week? I watched about 10 minutes of that stuff, and that was about 10 minutes more than I need to see. The argument is that in trying to protect his power and position, President Trump obstructed justice. But let's not kid ourselves. His enemies or his opponents are also motivated by a desire to protect their power and position. The question is, while these politicians are busy playing political games, who's governing the country? It's the same power mongering we see in the Jewish leaders. And this is why they knew they had to get rid of Jesus. It didn't matter what the evidence was. We need to get rid of this guy because he is going to remove us from our positions of authority. I mean, the very idea of Messiah, a ruler, a king, well, that means we have less authority. He's going to mess up the good thing we have going. Kill him. We pick it up again with the last sentence in verse 37. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me, says Jesus. What is truth? Pilate asked. With this, he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis for a charge against him. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in a rebellion. What is Pilate's argument here in scene two, Jesus is innocent. Yet again, we're faced with this ironic state of affairs. Agenda trumps truth. What is truth? Don't you love Pilate? He could have lived in the 21st century. What is truth? I wonder which great American university Pilate attended. Then he immediately follows up this modern bit of skepticism toward truth with a statement that sounds Awfully truthy. Second half of verse 38, I find no basis for a charge against him. No basis seems to imply that there is truth. There is a standard by which we judge. Pilate would have made a great professor. Nonetheless, Pilate gets it. He doesn't want an innocent man's blood on his hands, so he tries to get the Jews to release Jesus. Notice the healthy dig he gets in, even in his question. You want me to release the king of the Jews? The crowd shouts back, no. Why? Because agenda trumps truth. Don't bother me with something as insignificant as truth. I have an agenda to accomplish. Again, how timely, how like our culture. Don't bother me with the fact that killing a fetus is taking life. Don't bother me with the fact that even a three-year-old could see that Physiologically, man is made for woman and vice versa. Don't bother me with the fact that the intricate design of creation points us to a creator. My agenda trumps truth. I will say this, though, as a word of caution for those of us who hold the Bible to be the truth. We are all susceptible to making God's word say what we want it to say to support our own agendas. Believers, we have to be careful. Listen, God's word makes clear. It's one thing if you reject Jesus Messiah and say, you're not my Savior, you're not my Lord, and you also reject truth. That's one thing. It's a whole other thing if you say, Jesus, you are my Savior, you are my Lord, and then you go about watering down or throwing out anything in this book that doesn't fit with your lifestyle, your agenda. Believers, we, we cannot pick and choose. Either Jesus is Lord and we obey him wholeheartedly, or he isn't. And you got something better to do on a Sunday morning, right? Agenda does not trump truth for the follower of Jesus Christ. It should never be. By the way, this is part of the reason why we encourage inductive Bible study in this church some of you have been part of our Life on Life groups. It's kind of a, a light inductive Bible study, but it's still, that's the point of it, is letting the text speak to us. Not coming to God's Word and saying, you know, sometimes we do this thing with God's Word. What is God's will for me? Oh, you know, here's something. No, we, we need to read God's Word and read it the way it was meant to be read in context. 
And we need to read not searching for justification for our choices. We need to read it searching for His will. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness and all these things will be added to you as well. Matthew 6, 33. In John 18, however, it's more than just an insignificant misreading of biblical text. The religious leaders in Pilate's estimations are ignoring the very obvious truth that Jesus has done nothing wrong. This doesn't even touch on the fact that they are ignoring the biblical testimony about Jesus. Nonetheless, Pilate's argument continues in chapter 19 with this one, the fact that their accusations are baseless. Look at verses 1 through 5 in chapter 19. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and they struck him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. Now, on one hand, the fact that Pilate turns the God of all creation over to be flogged is hard to read. The mockery of the soldiers expressed in a crown of thorns, a purple robe, hail king of the Jews while striking him in the face. It's unthinkable. Again, it isn't that Pilate is a godly man nor even a good man. In this story, he's simply a realistic man. There's no basis in reality for these charges. It's almost as if he's hoping that a little harsh treatment of Jesus will appease the bloodthirst of this mob. But the reality we find is this irony. Mob mentality trumps reality. Again, I think of this mayor in Puerto Rico and the mob mentality overtaking the people. The people may be right in their conclusion that this guy has to go, and obviously they got rid of him, but it always concerns me when mobs dictate policy. This is what we find in verses 6 and 7. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews insisted, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. Now the question that they failed to ask, that they brush aside as insignificant, is what if he is the Son of God? Such a question might have led them to investigate whether Jesus' deeds back up his mind-blowing possibility. But you see, reality is not the goal here. The goal is protecting the status quo, protecting man's pride, man's pleasures, man's pursuits, man's power. Even so, all of this is starting to make Pilate a little nervous. Look at verses 8 through 10. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. And he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Can you hear the desperation in Pilate's voice? It's no longer a game. Pilate is afraid. Here's a man proclaiming to be the son of God. Pilate doesn't know what he is, but he certainly doesn't want to get entangled in the murder of a spiritual leader, especially one who's divine. This time, however, Pilate's argument is directed not at the Jews. It's directed at Jesus. Jesus is surrendering. Just why, are you sur why are you just giving up is Pilate's concern. It makes absolutely no sense. Here is one truth that is absolutely timeless, universal. Man's greatest fear is death. We don't like to talk about it. We don't like to think about it. And we certainly do all we can to avoid it. So Pilate does not understand why Jesus is wasting this opportunity to defend himself before the very one who could save him. What the good governor doesn't seem to see is that it, it's Pilate who's in need of saving. Jesus, who's the only one who can save him. Of course, the same can be said of the religious leaders. Yet again, we find irony in the fact that men of God kill God. 
Recently, I became aware of a minister group, one that professes to be of Christ, that has been charged with cult-like abuse of power. Such stories are disheartening, disgusting. How can the very ones charged with sharing the good news and caring for God's people let themselves become bad news, even tools of Satan? That is what we see here. The very ones who are supposed to be the keepers of the Holy Scripture are the ones who are killing God's Messiah, the one to whom the entire Old Testament points. And you have to, under, you have to understand what it means to be a Jew in the first century to really grasp the significance, the magnitude of what's going on here. Because if you read the Old Testament toward the end, after they've gone into captivity, there's constant cries for God's redemption, constant crying out to God, God, when are you going to save us? How long, O Lord, is a repeated refrain we find in the Psalms. How long, O Lord? And here is God giving them His Son, the Messiah, the answer to their greatest questions. And what do they do with Him? They kill Him. How like us. How like us to be all dramatic. Oh, how long, God, when are you going to save me? Yet we ignore the very things that He gives us that would give us hope, that would give us life, that would feed us, that would move us to Him, that would draw us closer to the One who cares about us. Such sad irony. This isn't a new issue, though. In fact, it's the very thing that Yahweh spoke out against in the Old Testament, whether it was supposed prophets who were speaking only what Israel wanted to hear, speaking what their itches, itching ears wanted to hear, or Israel's shepherds that were concerned only about themselves. You might wonder why it is that Jesus is using such strong language against these wolves in sheep's clothing. But it's no different from the strong language we find in books like Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 34 Verses 1 through 4 says, The word of Yahweh came to me. Now remember, this is Israel in captivity, crying out for a Savior, a Redeemer. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, This is what the sovereign Yahweh says, Woe to the shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? I can't help but see our politicians in these verses as well who are only concerned about themselves and their next election rather than being concerned about the people they're supposed to serve. But this is even worse because these are people who are in the name of God who are shepherds, who are misusing their power and position just for themselves. Verse 3, you eat the curds, which doesn't sound good to me, but I think is actually meant to be something that's really good. You clothe yourselves with the wool and slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. Verses 9 and 10. Therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of Yahweh. This is what... The sovereign Yahweh says, I'm against the shepherds and I will hold them accountable for my flock. I will remove them from tending the flock so that the shepherds can no longer feed themselves. I will rescue my flock from their mouths and it will no longer be food for them. You see, in the Gospel of John, history is repeating itself. The same thing God describes in Ezekiel is now taking place in John. In fact, this is the ultimate fulfillment. Israel's own shepherds are the ones who are seeking to kill an innocent man, their own Messiah. And to make it even worse, is a pagan governor who is the one who is pointing it out. But though Pilate doesn't get Jesus, he doesn't understand why he would let himself be executed. Despite his innocence, the prophecy is right there in Ezekiel. Chapter 34, verse 11, for this is what the sovereign Yahweh says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. 
and verses 22 through 24 say, I will save my flock and they will no longer be plundered. I will judge between one sheep and another. I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd. I, Yahweh, will be their God and my servant David will be the prince among them. I, Yahweh, have spoken. David? Question, where's David when Ezekiel's written? He is dead and in the grave. What son of David is Ezekiel talking about? Well, it's just one of the many ways that Messiah is referred to in the Old Testament. Ezekiel's prophesying about this son of David, this Messiah, this anointed one of God who would come and bring salvation to his people. And here in the book of John, that prophecy is coming to fulfillment. And yet the irony that Israel's shepherds are the very one who say crucify, crucify. Look at chapter 19, verses 11 through 16 of John. Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jews kept shouting, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which is in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked? We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So finally, we arrive at the, the verdict, and it's guilty. Of course, we all know that this trial was rigged by God the Father. Jesus was innocent, but it was God's redemptive plan which was put into place before the creation of the world, which caused Jesus to bear our guilt so that we would not have to. And this is the greatest irony of all. As we read in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. According to the Bible, we have all sinned and are guilty before God this is our verdict. This is our verdict. We are guilty. And the sense it carries with it, according to Romans 6, 23, is death. But Jesus died in our place so that we would not have to. And as a result, the verdict has been reversed. Notice, it has not been reversed because the charges against us were found to be false. We are guilty. But Jesus, through his death on the cross, in our place, and by his resurrection from the dead, has changed the verdict from guilty to innocent. What John reveals in his retelling of this trial, in his reframing of the verdict, is not only that Jesus is innocent, but that all who trust in Christ are judged to be innocent, forgiven, reconciled to our God. Have you embraced this verdict by grace through faith? To embrace by grace is to acknowledge that it is a gift. That's what grace means. That's all the word grace means. Sometimes I don't like that some of our religious words sound so religious. Grace just means gift. It means it's something you don't earn, you don't deserve. It's given to you gratis. Grace, free. I, I can't think of any better words. Have you embraced this gift that Jesus, by submitting himself to mistreatment at the hands of the Jewish leaders, mistreatment at the hands of the Roman soldiers, murder by means of a cross, paid the penalty for our sin for us so that we would not have to? That's grace. Grace. G-R-A-C-E. God's Riches at Christ's expense. Excuse me, or you can put it another way, God's righteousness at Christ's expense. 
and it is received by faith, which means that it is not based upon our religiosity, our righteousness, but our belief in Christ's accomplished work on the cross, our hope in Christ crucified. Christ crucified. That's our message. As we read in 1 Corinthians, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. Isn't that exactly what we see here in John 19? To the Jews, a self-sacrificing Messiah who lives not for power or pleasure, but for doing God's will is a stumbling block. The Jewish leaders stumble over Jesus. To Pilate, the Gentile, Jesus' willingness to surrender himself to death despite his innocence is foolishness. Pilate sees Jesus as a fool. Even so, this stumbling block, this foolishness, Christ crucified, this is what we preach. This isn't a pat answer, an oversimplification, a life hack. This is the heart of the gospel. I love what Pastor Eugene Peterson writes about this. He says, there is one summary phrase I've come to have more and more respect for. It came out of the Holy Spirit genius of St. Paul. In various letters to first century congregations, he said or wrote eight times just two words, Christ crucified. It's not what you might think. Not God is love, not love your neighbor, not keep the commandments, but Christ crucified. The more you think about it, although brief, it is not a reduction, but a concentration, not a blurring of reality, but a focusing, not a watering down, but a distillation. Peterson argues that Christ crucified is not just another great saying in Scripture. It is the truth that is at the root of our existence as Christians. He writes, we owe our origin, our root existence to something that happened. What happened? Christ was crucified. Nobody wants to start here. And especially we who come to church, we want to start with a big idea. God is love. There is purpose to life. Those are true. Or a grand vision or a terrific proposal. Let's get America back to God. Or a rousing challenge. Be all you can be. Or a shattering rebuke. Repent or perish. But Christ crucified? Who wants that? It's almost as though we think we can do better than Christ crucified. Maybe come up with a more catchy slogan. Rebrand with something more relatable. But it's not about sales quotas. It's not about likes. It's not about brand recognition. It's about reality. The reality of our sin and the Savior's sacrifice. The Jews didn't get it. A Messiah that came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Pilate, the Gentile, didn't get it. An innocent man willing to give his life. And if we are honest, sometimes we don't get it. Charles Wesley put it well in his famous hymn, And Can It Be? Tis mystery all, the immortal dies. Who can explore his strange design? But it is this enigma that is at the root of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It is the reality that gives us hope, gives us life, gives us our life mission. Christ is crucified. Sin is conquered. The grave is vanquished. The verdict for us has been reversed. We are reconciled to our God. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Let's pray. And Lord, we rejoice in this enigma this morning this mystery, this unthinkable reality, this irony that the only perfect man is condemned to die. And yet we know it is not based on human decision or man's will, but is accordance with your great redemptive purposes, O God. And Lord, we are so grateful to be grafted into these redemptive purposes. We are so grateful to be called sons and daughters of the living God because, Jesus, of what you accomplished for us on that cross. Christ crucified. Jesus, we give you praise this morning for what you've done for us.
continue to accomplish your kingdom purposes in us, we pray in Christ's precious name. Amen.